I'm Danny, that witch next door. And you're listening to That Witch Podcast. Hello, friend. Hello, neighbor. Welcome to season four of That Witch Podcast. I'm Danny. If you've never been here before, and this is the first ever episode of That Witch Podcast that you are listening to, I would really be honored to personally welcome you here to our magical neighborhood. Um, I'm Danny, and I'm That Witch Next Door, and I'll be your host, your guide, your mentor, and instructor in all things magic, witchcraft, astrology, and witchy business. If those sound like things that are right up your alley, you've probably found yourself in a pretty pretty welcome, fun, and um, accessible place. I really try to make the information here on the show as applicable to as many people as possible. I definitely try to offer information in a way that makes it feel fun and easy to make your own and to make it work for you and your lifestyle and your practice. Um, I'm all about no rules around here and uh, building a strong strong and formidable trust with your intuition. Uh, You are divine. We are all divine fractals of source and or the universe, however you like to refer to it, (laughs) if you will. Um, And we are getting into some really, really, really fun stuff today that I'm very excited to take all of you down this rabbit hole with me. Um, If this is not your first time here on the show, hi and welcome back. I missed you so much. Um, I hope you were able to take a listen to uh, yesterday's Monday Musings episode. That was a really fun one. We're all post-Leo full moon, so if you're still feeling the uh, ripple effects of the Leo full moon from this past weekend, and you haven't already listened to our Monday Musings episode, I highly recommend that you go ahead and do that. Um, As I'm sure you saw in the show title for today, we are talking about love, lust, and more sex magic. And again, if this is your first time here, you might be going, what do you mean? more. Uh, You can check out the show notes right now. I've already linked a couple of really helpful previous episodes that would provide a lot of helpful information and support in addition to this episode, including our first episode that we did on love and breakup spells, as well as sex magic. And the sex magic episode was one of our most um, enthusiastically received episodes. Everybody loves the sex magic episode. I um, do not at all specialize in this area. So I want to make that abundantly clear. This entire episode is based on my own experiences, my own research um, that I've done personally. And... um, you know, how I, how, how I feel my own opinions. Um, so this is not in any way licensed or certified, uh, advice of any, any kind, which is exactly why I also linked the previous episode on shadow work, because I personally believe that all three of those previous episodes, if you've never done anything, anything before, with love magic, um, with lusty energy and that kind of work or done any kind of sex magic, I highly, highly recommend listening to those previous episodes. They are going to lay a very, very valuable foundation of knowledge for you so that you are entering into this um, beautiful and sacred but very deep magic in the right headspace Um, with a lot of divine clarity for yourself and a lot of alignment for yourself. And you will find as we get into today, that is one of the biggest 
drawbacks here uh, with love, lust, and sex magic. That's where things start to get a little bit cloudy is when we're cloudy and we're showing up from an emotionally reactive place. Um, Emotion is very, very much a part of this conversation. Don't get me wrong. I'm excited to be the big, giant, water sign, water natal chart (laughs) that I am uh, to be able to offer you my insight on that. Believe you me, emotion definitely has its sacred right and place in all of this work. So we don't want to detach from that. And we also want to bring a lot of wisdom. Okay. We do want to, we do want to invite logic and practicality and clarity to this party. I assure you, um, you will be very, very, very glad that you did. I, um, you know, my experience with love, lust, and sex magic is really interesting when I reflect on this. Um, since I was a little kid, I remember being a hopeless romantic for as long as I can remember. I've actually unpacked it a little bit in therapy because I really, I mean, I remember being a bleeding heart since day one, you know, and all of my bleeding hearts out there, um, what's up? High five in solidarity. Uh, not everybody is like that. I, you know, I've become friends with, I've interacted with people over the years. Um, I'm married to somebody who is much easier, um, much more capable of and natural with this capacity to kind of detach from emotion on a whim or on instinct or, um, just when it's necessary. This is something that is very, very, very challenging for me. Um, I am quite attached to my emotions. And this plays a big role in how I experience and have experienced love and lust and sex in my life. Um, Another really important disclaimer before we get into today's episode is This, I mean, partially a trigger warning. So if for any reason, any of these subjects are triggering to you right now, um, Valentine's Day coming up is triggering, thinking about love and lust and flirtation and romance and and sex and whether that's on an individual or a partner or multi-partner level, if any of those things feel just too uncomfortable and triggering for you, then this is just not the episode for you, my friend. And that's okay. So I would not move forward with this one. Um, That being said, disclaimer number two is this is a sex positive space. And one of my, one of my biggest goals with this podcast is to normalize some of the more taboo topics that should definitely, in my opinion, not be considered a taboo topic. Um, just like death, um, we get real about talking about death and grief work and shadow work around here. And that very much includes sex magic and sexuality, sexual experiences. And This is a uh, very big umbrella. This is a huge umbrella. The umbrella is usually a lot bigger than you think it is. Honestly, no matter where you feel you fall on the like sexual intelligence or sexual education spectrum, the, the umbrella of how broad sexuality and sexual experience is for humankind is probably so much bigger than anyone can imagine. Um, Again, regardless of amount of experience, but I, I want you to know that it will not hurt my feelings. If you know me on a personal 
level. And it just feels weird to hear me talk about my own sex life and love life and stuff like that. Um, especially if for any reason, a family member is listening to this again, probably not the episode for you, my friend, I would just wait till the next one. (laughs) Um, because I really want to be able to talk about this stuff and, and give people, give people space to feel comfortable talking about it themselves. And one of the best ways to do that is just by example. Now, by no means am I about to go into detail of my sex life. Get out of here. Absolutely not. I still, listen to me, My I have a Pisces moon in my eighth house. I have a Cancer stellium in my 12th house. And I have a Scorpio stellium at my IC. Um, from my third house to my to my fourth house. Privacy is a top value of mine. Um, and it's one of the things that makes my sex life and sexual experience in this life sacred in, in certain ways. So don't worry. I'm not about to dive into any nitty gritty details. Cause I just, I don't do that personally, but there are many wonderful people out there that do, and they get into it and they bear it and they share it all. And I am fucking here for it. What I want to do is, um, I want to look at love, lust, and sex magic through the lens of witchcraft, um, through the lens of, you know, the human journey in an individual, individual incarnation, um, the purpose of these experiences, what they teach us, why we should experience them, um, and how to, utilize them in our craft and our manifestation. Um, I cannot, absolutely cannot dive into this topic without highly, highly, highly recommending that you listen to my dear friend and client's uh, podcast, Sex Work for the Soul with Mary Sue. Um, You can listen to it on the very app that you're on right now. She is one of my clients, like I said, one of my graduates from my mentorship program, Last year, we've been working together for just over a year now, which is so, so crazy. Um, She actually interviewed me for her podcast, and it will be coming out next week on Valentine's Day. How adorable. That just worked out that way, and I love it so much. Um, And so if you really love everything that we're talking about here today, and you are also someone that is embarking on a sexual liberation journey, um, a sexual healing journey, any, you know, I really cannot recommend her podcast enough. Um, And now that I'm giving you a little heads up before my guest feature on her show next week, you can go listen to her show um, this week in preparation and binge all of her episodes. So make sure you go listen to it. Sex Work for the Soul. Her name is Mary Sue XOXO on Instagram. All the information is in the show notes here below. Mary Sue is also doing a fucking awesome, awesome workshop for us in that witch school next week. Um, All of our students absolutely loved Mary Sue's uh, previous workshop that she did on the art of reading tarot for others. Um, That's right. She's this beautiful tarot reader and mentor by day and sex worker by night. No, she's all the things all the time, but I love saying it that way. You're like a superhero. Um, but she is coming back for another magical workshop for us in that witch school. I cannot wait. And um, this is going to be all about tarot for relationships. I specifically asked Mary Sue to do this workshop because as an online sex worker and a spiritual mentor, tarot reader, astrologer, she has she has had to learn the art of boundaries, um, utilizing spirituality and tools like tarot and astrology in her own sexual experience and sexuality as, as a person, but also as a career person as well. And I was like, honestly, I just think that you have such wonderful gained wisdom and experience in this arena. What, better tarot teacher to specifically talk to people about utilizing tarot when it comes to relationships, because I think things, I think it could be a really effective tool. And I think 
it gets really, really muddy because of how much emotion and how much of our heart um, goes into love and relationships and connections. Um, So I'm really excited for this workshop that Mary Sue is going to be teaching for us next week. This is going to be next week on Monday the 13th um, because I thought it'd be the perfect little precursor to uh, Valentine's Day especially anyone doing any kind of healing work in in these arenas uh, this time of year. So, um, and plus we've got Venus in Pisces right now. This is a perfect time to be really diving headfirst into all of this. So if all of this sounds like your jam, make sure you go subscribe to and follow Mary Sue on Instagram um, and her podcast, Sex Work for the Soul. And um, if you're not already joining us in that witch school and you want to be able to join us for that workshop, head to the show notes, thatwitchnextdoor.com slash enroll to join us today. So you don't miss it. Um, Now, let's talk about love, lust, and, and, and sex magic as far as ethics go. So I think that this is one of the most important entry points into the conversation because when we talk about a love spell, just for example, there's a really strong and really prominent connotation that immediately comes up. And we're going to just call a spade a spade because the truth is this is born of the stigma around witches and witchcraft. Love spells can, the term and the practice of it, it might leave an unpleasant taste in your mouth. And I want you to know that if you're one of those people, you're 100% not alone. And it honestly makes a lot of sense. I want to offer a little bit of clarity here love spells, sex magic, lust magic, in a lot of ways are very, very similar to tarot and astrology and the mainstream stigma that's really stuck with those practices. That, you know, once you personally dove into tarot or dove into astrology, learned it for yourself, learned its roots, started practicing it for yourself, You usually you realize, um, oh, you know, the stigma and the rumors and the myths or whatever about these practices, you know, they come from these really specific and very unethical uses of these tools. And none of us are in a position to deny that that's ever happened because it's flat out not true. It has happened. People have been and will continue to exploit spirituality probably for all time um, because it works, unfortunately. It's a very, again, I it is an extremely dirty, shitty, unethical thing to do. Um but it's effective because people put their whole heart and souls and trust into their spirituality and faith. And when you do that, yeah, you're going to catch some people in a vulnerable state and, and have the ability to take advantage of them. Does that mean that you should? No, of course not. Which is why it's so important to talk about ethics and to talk about the way in which we practice our magic and our spirituality in this life. But I want you to know that it's a lot fewer and farther between than you think. So let's, I'm going to share with you my personal experience was a little bit here, very brief. Otherwise we'll be here all day going into Danny's romantic biography. Um, I've got the Scorpio stellium I talked about. I got the Pisces moon in the eighth house, um, fifth house, which is an area we would look to for like lust and sex and pleasure and stuff. That is a Capricorn area for me. 
and um, I have a Capricorn stellium there, including my Saturn, who does somewhat feel like a bit of a chaperone. <laughs> just a chaperone presence in that area that I'm actually now later in life a lot more grateful for in hindsight. Um, (laughs) My Saturn chaperone probably saved me from a lot of experiences from being a young teenager that I probably would have really regretted or just cringed at (laughs) later on. And I already have them, but I mean, it probably kept me from a lot more. Uh, I have been a bleeding heart since I was a kid, like I said, but I have been uh, very sexual for a very long time. <clears throat> um, I have my own childhood sexual trauma that I am not going to talk about on the show, um, but that I have had to work through that could have. I'm not really interested in like definitively learning if this is the case or not. It very well could have been what led me to sexual activation a lot earlier than maybe I quote unquote should have. Um, But again, I'm not really, this is exactly the shadow work I'm talking about, which is why I want to be transparent and share all this part with you. Um, For me personally, I don't really have an interest in defining where like my early sexual activation necessarily came from. I'm a lot more interested in navigating my feelings about that now and releasing any guilt or shame or self-deprecation for that um, because that doesn't serve me at all. The sexual, the early sexual activation happened regardless. I can't change that. I can't take that away. Um, And I have to just be honest with myself about like, this was my path. This was how young I was when I started doing things with partners. Um, These were the things I enjoyed. And these were the things I definitely didn't enjoy. um, And that I continued doing anyways and didn't talk about. Um, These were the things that I finally did start voicing and saying, I don't want to do those things. You know, I've really... I am proud to say, especially in all of my Plutonian and work with my Plutonian work and my practice and devotion to my patron deity, Hades, I've done a lot, a lot of very intentional healing when it comes to my sexual journey and my sexuality. I am bisexual and it took me, so to give you reference, I am 32, I almost forgot. 32 years old. And it took me until I was probably, I don't know, 29, 30, really not that long ago, you guys. Yeah, probably 29. Took me until I was probably 29 years old to just say that and have that and identify with that. And That was a very big piece for me has been navigating that. And I think I've, I think I've talked about this a little bit on the show. I can't remember which episode though. So sorry. Um, I can't remember at all. It was so long ago. I remember that, but because I remember so many of you reached out and had shared that you had had similar experiences, which is again, exactly why I talk about this stuff. Um, When it comes to my sexual experience now and moving forward, here's what I care about. Here's what I'm interested in when it comes to my own like shadow work and healing journey of all this stuff. I care about working through and releasing shame and self-hatred that is clearly, clearly holding me back or harming me. Um... That is my primary concern and priority. Um, I also highly, highly, highly prioritize my own joy and fulfillment. And what I have had to realize, which is what ties into what we kind of started with at the very, very, very beginning today. I had to admit to myself, I'm an emotional person. And when it comes to being sexually charged for me, 
I have to be emotionally charged. Again, it is the opposite for some people. This might not be your experience. It might be the opposite. You might find that you specifically detach from your emotions and 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 your sexual charge turns on from there. It doesn't matter. There's no one right way. The the one thing I want to encourage you to do is start having these conversations with yourself because all of this stuff when it comes to love, lust, and sex magic, it all starts with you and your experiences. You need to ask yourself now, why? Why do I want to do this? Why do I want this partner? Why do I want this experience? What am I looking for? What am I definitely not looking for? What do I not want? That is a huge, huge, huge one. Um, Because I think that we look at love and lust and sex magic as this very like, cheesy, hunky-dory part of witchcraft and people like toss it by the wayside and don't practice it or they do in this very, again, muddied and messy and to be honest, mindless way. And it makes a lot of sense why, again, this entire branch of magic gets as shit on as it does Um, because we're not, most people are not approaching it from a clear headspace in the very, very first place. So when we think about the, um, like the umbrella that love and lust and sex and like what that is as far as our human journey and our experience goes, the purpose of this. I, when I was preparing for the show, here's what I wrote down experiences of love and lust and sex in this life brings us desire, attraction, value, fun and joy, intimacy, surrender, power, beauty, confidence, and trust, and so much more. But those were like the big, big powerhouses that came out to me. And so what this means is that when we engage in experiences of love and lust and sex, this is how we learn and grow in these various areas. This is how we learn about desire and attraction, rejection, trust and mistrust value what we love and disgust, the things that we don't, fun and joy, as well as pain and grief and loss, connection and disconnection, vulnerability, that trust, that intimacy, and ultimately that surrender. We learn about power dynamics. We absolutely learn about safety in all of these areas as well. Safety and trust, safety in our confidence, safety in our surrender, safety in our values, safety in our joy, safety in our loss and our pain, right? We learn about and we grow through these things by experiencing love and experiencing lust and experiencing sex. And so... This is why it's it can be such an incredibly empowering path to walk and branch to explore in magic and spirituality. But because it's so deep and because it teaches us about not just all of those wonderful things that I mentioned, but also those extremely heart-crushing things, and soul crushing things that feel almost impossible to get through it makes a lot of sense why um where the mud comes from when i say things get muddied and things start to get messy and we lose clarity so 
before I was a witch um, officially, right? Before I was self-labeled a witch and before I was purposefully practicing magic, I did that. I like became official, if you will, uh, in my mid twenties. And all before that, I'm this bleeding heart. I'm sexually active at a pretty early age. Overall, nothing like I was. So just to give you reference, I was st- I was having regular partnered sex. Um, not long after I turned fifteen, um, and it's it was it's always been that way, and. So that was my freshman year of high school. And the only reason I've ever considered that early is because of um, the reaction from my parents. But when they did eventually, well, when my mom eventually found out, but um, I guess that's the only frame of reference I really had. I, when I look back on it, I was one of the first ones of my friends in my personal peer group where I grew up. Um, But again, I have no, I have no frame of reference when it comes to like an entire country, like where I fall on the average. Um, And definitely not as, not even close to where I fall uh, when it comes to a, a global spectrum. I have no idea what the average is at all. But based on what I was told and how I was taught and raised Um, I was relatively early on, um, and I made a pretty harsh change. I was that Saturn chaperone in my fifth house was fucking prominent all the way solidly through eighth grade. Um, seventh and eighth grade were what one would very endearingly call my awkward phase. And I was learning how to, you know, present myself and how I looked and all those things. Um, so I didn't, I had a couple boyfriends in middle school, but nothing, nothing big. Um, I did get my first kiss and that was it. Um, that was it. Literally. I got kissed one time and held hands with that boyfriend who I completely fucking devoted myself to. (laughs) Not just during the solid one month that we dated, um, but essentially the rest of my time. Because I think we dated, yeah, like an early seventh grade and I just never stopped being obsessed with him the entire rest of the time. I would add on other crushes and other boys that I became obsessed with. Um, But... Uh, that was, for me, that was, that was the extent of my anything kind of affectionate love or even remotely sexually related up until that point. I got, I got kissed one time. And other than that, I was a person of infatuation. I would become infatuated with people. It took me years again, up until the last couple of years to look back and realize Um, the females that I was attracted to. And a big, big part of that was because I buried that, suppressed that in shame. Like, what's wrong with you for being attracted to this person? This person's your friend. This is so wrong of you. Um, Yay (laughs) for sexual shame work. Oh, it's really fucking hard. So if you're a person who is working through those kinds of things, Um, as well for yourself. I'm with you in solidarity. It's really fucking hard to work through. Um, So in my memory, you know, my history of love and lust and romance, this is all attached to boys early on. But in retrospect, especially as I've gone through a lot of my mental health and healing journey, yes, I have realized in hindsight, oh, I also definitely had attraction and feelings for females. They were just very different because of how I coped with um, my own shame of that. So, um, (laughs) so this is why, man, it's so funny. I always, am like, we're gonna have a really fun episode talking about love and lust and sex magic. And I can't help but but when we get real, I do always promise you real magic for real life. And that does mean we get to laugh a lot and have a lot of fun, but it also means we get very fucking heavy and transparent around here as well. And I think it's just as important. So, um, you know, I was this person of infatuation and then I, and I'm not very, 
I'm just going to call it what it is. I'm not very good looking yet. Again, you know, I've got acne. I don't know how to take care of that. I don't know how to do my hair yet. I'm growing into my <laughs> Leo rising. Um, my husband, fun fact, my husband right now, I met in seventh grade and he was in eighth grade and we had assigned seats next to each other in gym class on my first day of school. That's how I met him. He also rode the bus. Um, but we, I am, I don't think we ever would have talked if I had, we not get, gotten sat next to each other. And he gave me a really cute nickname based on my name that I had to write on my gym t-shirt. <laughs> Do you remember having to write your name on your gym clothes? <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Um, <clears throat> definitely became infatuated with him. And he was one of the only boys that turned me down that I um, confess my love to that turned me down in a really kind and compassionate way and very respectful way. And he, um, and he and I became really, really good friends after that. I was fucking crushed, but I remember that it didn't take me very long to be friends with them again, because I was in love with them, because <laughs> I was so infatuated. But then freshman year, watch out, bitches. Everything's different. I'm learning how to be a Leo rising. I'm learning how to express myself and how to take care of myself and how I like to feel and look good, all those things. So I have what the kids now refer to as quite the glow up, okay? <laughs> Um, I had this confirmed to me even by several well-meaning, but not as nice boys. I do remember a few boys in freshman year saying something like, or it had, you know, how like rumors would go around and it would get back to you. Somehow I remember getting back to me that people were like, oh yeah, like you're much hotter than you were. Like, damn, thank God. <laughs> Oh my God. Teenage millennial hood is so funny. Uh, I, I really think from what I see in general, I'm seeing teenagers be more kind and respectful to each other. I know there's still plenty of fucked up bullying out there that we got to keep, keep teaching kids how to treat each other by setting a better example ourselves. But, um, I do see a lot of improvement. I hope it's going to continue moving that way. Cause we had it rough. We gave it rough to each other. We were not very nice to each other. And again, this was very well-meaning. That was a compliment. You know what I mean? To them, that was a compliment. And now we're, you know, learning how to actually compliment people, but you know, I've got the glow up. It's true. We'll call a spade a spade. I, I, I looked better the following year and now I'm like in the game and I am like in the dating sphere and I date several boys right off of the bat from others. You know, that's the nice part about high school. Now there's all these other schools, fresh meat everywhere. Right? <laughs> um, and so I, uh, and I'm referring, I was referring to all the boys as fresh meat just to put that out there. I wasn't referring to myself as fresh meat. <laughs> so, um, dated a bunch of boys, but then, uh, land my first serious boyfriend. And that's when, you know, not only am I like now sexually activated cause I'm now sexually active and doing, um, partnered foreplay, but which I did not know that's what it was called because back then you referred to it strictly as bases. If not, you just labeled the act itself. Um, and so people would just walk around and be like, oh yeah, um, she got fingered last weekend. <laughs> just, hey, I already gave you the trigger warning. We're dropping some shit on this episode. This is not an appropriate episode for young years. Um, and so, or certain, any years that doesn't like this conversation. So back then, that's how we referred to it. Now, like the, the like more PC and, and just more accurate and articulate way <laughs> to go about talking about it. That doesn't have to be so fucking cringy. Jesus, we were hilarious. Um, again, I was doing a lot of um, partnered foreplay before I actually, you know, what we call losing our virginity. I am uh, somebody who on my own sexual healing journey, I'm really intrigued by this idea of potentially eradicating that. 
um, and like potentially eradicating the the like sacredness of virginity and instead protecting the sacredness of the divine transition. Um, not everybody becomes sexually active. I want to make that known. And that's very valid that there are asexual people. Um, sometimes people are asexual their entire lives. Sometimes they're asexual for stages and phases of their life. But there are people that um, never become or just turn away from being sexually active. So I don't want to get in the habit of saying, this happens for everyone. This is a universal experience to lose your virginity, to, to become sexually active. It is extremely, extremely common, but it is not technically universal. Um, And this is very, very valid. I, I learned a lot about asexuality in the last couple of years, and it really needs to be protected among the sex positivity community, 100%. Um, Anyways, so... I do want to protect, however, the sacredness of the divine sexual transition, that we do have this threshold that we cross. Some people get to cross it in this really beautiful way that comes with choice and consent, and some people don't, and some people get that taken away from them, and they don't get to make that choice. And the transition is thrust upon them in an absolutely horrifying, traumatic way. Um, but I, I do know, I may not know the, the like blanket here for all of this. Cause I don't think that it exists, but I do know that talking about and normalizing the transition I guess the best, most universally understood term for it would be called like that transition into adulthood. That's how a lot of us were taught about it. You know, sex is not for kids, sex is for adults. So if you're going to be engaging in sexual activity, you must be an adult. That's not true when we're teenagers. We're not adults. Most of us are sexually active. Um, So I want you to know that like all of this messy stuff, it's important to sift through it for yourself. It's important to do with yourself what I've had the balls to do with you here today and like just share and talk about a lot of this with you. Um, Because this is where you'll find your own clarity. You'll find your own desires, your own motives, your own your own pain, right? Which eventually tells you what your non-negotiables are and where your boundaries lie. If you don't explore all of it, then you don't know where your boundaries lie. And boundaries, my friend, are a fucking key, absolute key component to all of this. Um, All of this. So what I want to kind of do now, now that I've hopefully given you what I, my intention with this whole first chunk of the episode was to open up the conversation, not just with you, with each other, but for yourself within yourself and potentially within any of your partnerships. Um, Because I think that's the first place to start. And then when you kind of know where you're navigating, why you're navigating and who you're navigating it with, then we can kind of get into what we would consider to be more of the fun stuff, right? The stuff that you probably came here for today, (laughs) the witchy stuff. Um, So let's start with a couple of recommendations here. Right off the bat, I I gathered um, some correspondences for everybody. I wanted to be able to list out you know, different colors, crystals, herbs, deities, days of the week, etc. cetera, um, associated with love, lust, sex magic. Um, so I did that, of course, using Llewellyn's book of correspondences. You can find that linked in the show notes below. You can also find it linked in our neighborhood library. This is a free resource on my website right now. If you go to thatwitchnextdoor.com slash resources and you go to the neighborhood library, it's a master link list of my most top recommended 
resources, tools, books, websites, tarot decks, um, people to work with, all kinds of goodies. And this is an ever-growing list um, as, as we continue on this journey together. So that is a wonderful resource to just have bookmarked for yourself anyways. Um, but you can find my book recommendations there, including Llewellyn's book of correspondences. Now, the book of correspondences is not at all a perfectly complete list. It is, however, in my opinion, a really, really solid jumping off point and an excellent source of inspiration. I rarely need any kind of a blueprint for a ritual or a spell or a ceremony that I want to perform. I just open up the book to whatever intention it is that I'm exploring or that it, you know, ties in with uh, what I'm manifesting or working on or working with that day um, or what I'm preparing for. And usually as I read through the correspondences themselves, all of the inspiration I need comes forth and I'm able to just let my intuition guide the ritual with these various tools that I, that I collected for myself based on what I learned in the correspondences list. So I, there's a lot, honestly, um, it was too much to write down in my notes. So I'm going to just, I took some pictures of the book pages and I'm going to just go through some of them for you. If you are able to, this is a great time to take some notes. If you're driving or anything right now and you're not able to, right now is a really good point to pause the show and take a look at the timestamp right now so that you can come back to this point and listen to it again. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, the YouTube video chapters are already conveniently there for you because of my wonderful uh, media manager, Jenny SRP. Um, so that's really the YouTube video is a great, great resource just so everybody knows this. Even if you don't usually listen to the show on YouTube, I highly recommending following me and subscribing to my YouTube channel because you can utilize all of my regular episodes. Um, there, there are little mini episode libraries. So when you click on a video, uh, on the video for today's episode, you'll be able to navigate through all of the different sections and chapters of today's episode. It makes it really nice for those episodes like this one that you might want to go back and listen to just parts and pieces of and take some notes on. Um, so like I said, if you're going to take notes, now would be a great time to grab a pen or pencil and a piece of paper. And <clears throat> we're just going to go through these general intentions of love and lust and sex and romance and sex sensuality. All of these intentions can be found in Llewellyn's book of correspondences. And you can read the complete and full list for yourself. I'm going to just go through the ones that jump out at me that I think. Um, are easily accessible. I'm definitely going to point out the ones that I can pronounce. So especially when it comes to deities or like plants, please, if you do have the book of correspondences and you go and read the list and you're like, why did she not mention any of these? It's because I can't pronounce it and I didn't want to totally butcher it. So I highly recommend this book if you're somebody who is constantly going to Google to look up correspondences for rituals and spells. Um, the internet serves as a wonderful free resource for that. Um, but once I bought the book of correspondences, um, it's just, I, I can't help it. It's my favorite, easy to reference resource for this stuff. So when it comes to sex, um, and in a lot of ways, when it comes to love and lust as well, I want you to think of the orgasm, the full moon, AKA the peak or the height of a moment or an experience. This is, in a nutshell, what love, lust, and sex all achieve for us and why we all desire them and go after them or try to manifest it and attract it to ourselves. Um, it is this like full, total, complete embodiment and fulfillment. And it's why it's such an addicting and, and longed for feeling and experience. Um, however, the moon is a beautiful, beautiful 
uh, representation of the fact that we're not supposed to experience this unending, always and forever. The moon cycle every single month from that new moon all the way to the waxing crescent into the first quarter, into the full moon, down the wax, or sorry, down the waning uh, last quarter moon, down the waning crescent, back into the new moon. When this happens every single month, it is a real life example that the universe is giving us, that the moon specifically is giving us, showing us nothing is permanent. Everything is always changing. Everything is always moving and always cycling. I promise you it will come back again because just like this feeling in this moment is not permanent and it's not going to last forever and ever and ever, your time away from it will also not last forever. We have to embrace this concept on both sides of the coin. It greatly, greatly improves our clarity and our balance when we're doing love, lust, and sex magic work. When we remember, and trust me, I'm a fixed sign who works a lot with the themes and lessons around permanency and struggles with change. (laughs) So I'm speaking from an extremely personal learned space here. Um, You have to remember that just like this wonderful fulfillment and good ecstasy feeling right now won't last forever and ever and ever, I promise you that even though it is going to go away and this feeling will end right now, it won't end forever. You will get to experience it again. Look to the lunar cycle. Look to the solar season. Look to the, the planetary cycles. What, right? This is what we use astrology for. These cycles are constantly showing us and teaching us, God, astrology was probably the main, main, main branch of my spirituality and, and practice that taught me the most about trust in, in those divine cycles of our universe. And by the way, if you love astrology and you want to be able to, you know, learn enough about your chart and other people's charts, just like this, where I'm able to draw these real life parallels and examples that help grow me, um, and and nourish me and nurture me on this path and this life, as well as my career, my business, my relationships, then my astrology class is for you, my friend. And astrology with that witch next door is coming very, very, very soon to the neighborhood. Make sure you are on my email list so you don't miss the crazy, amazing flash sale that will come with the launch of that course. Um, It's for everybody who's ready to take their education outside of the podcast and get serious about learning how to read charts. Um, So just like astrology teaches us that there's always the ebb and flow, the cycles are always going, yes, this moment won't last forever and it also won't be gone forever. We can learn a lot about trust and we can go into this kind of magic knowing that. I really, really think this is important advice to give you before I start giving you all these (laughs) spell and ritual tips. I don't, I don't advise you to go into these things with, this is going to last forever. I'm going to cast this spell so that this lasts forever because I want this to last forever because I want it to never go away from me. I don't know that that's the most effective use of your magic. What I would say is let's learn from the orgasm. Let's learn from the full moon. Let's learn from the archetype of the peak and what that means, which is, a grand point of culmination and release all the way filled up so that it spills out a little bit. And suddenly you are surrounded by joy and fulfillment and ecstasy 
this is what the full moon represents. This is what the summer solstice represents. The summer solstice is the full moon of the solar cycle. This is what the orgasm represents, okay? There's, there's examples of peaks everywhere. That, that crazy lovesick feeling when you're talking to someone new and texting and can't wait for them to text back and they do and you're lot that same energy. You're at a peak. You're at this like total beautifully overfilling or sorry, overflowing excitement, fulfillment and embodiment stage and uh, it all surrounded in ecstasy. Again, that's another example of a peak or of a culmination point. And love is as well. That feeling, that, that, that feeling of total and complete appreciation, like simultaneously with desire. I don't know, I don't know better human words to describe it. I can feel it on the inside better than I can say it with my words. But that's, that's the, the peak or culmination point that love teaches us and brings us is that it's that feeling of total and complete and yet beyond you appreciation and desire and attraction all bundled into one at the same time. Again, so much so that it's overflowing and spilling out and surrounding you with this ecstasy and fulfillment all around you. So it makes a lot of sense why we chase a lot of these things. But if we can surrender, right? Remember that these experiences teach us about the importance of surrender. If we can trust and surrender to the fact that it's not supposed to be forever, then what we could potentially do for ourselves in our magic is harness this power. Number one, we can literally tap into and utilize this energy the energy of the peak, the energy of that point of culmination, that that feeling that I was describing. We can tap into that and anchor into that and we can utilize it. We can utilize it to manifest other things in our life, Um, especially uh, things like, uh, like your career. So if your career is something that's needing more love, meaning I want to love my career more, I want to be working with people I love and I appreciate, they appreciate me, all these things, utilizing something like sex magic and the orgasm, right? And those feelings and those sensations can definitely be directed toward your career path. You can harness, you can tap into and harness and utilize that feeling of love that I was describing and bring it into your workspace with you and bring it into that abundance and career and professional uh, manifestation work that you're doing. So we can not only utilize magic and spell work and ritual to attract experiences of lust and love and sex to us, We can also use the energy of love and lust and sexual experiences and direct that energy into other areas of our life that would benefit from it and benefit from that kind of power and benefit from that kind of energy, okay? So I don't want you to stop there. Um, Where we are going to stop for a really brief moment, however, is... Uh, right here. And we're going to thank our sponsor for today's episode. I'll be right back. Hi, neighbor. I want to take a quick moment to thank our episode affiliate for the day. One of my favorite companies and products to date, Magic of Eye and their astrological planner. If this is not your first time in the neighborhood and you've been around for a while, you very well know how much I love and how frequently I mention this planner. It has been a part of my astrological journey pretty much since the very beginning of my studies. This planner not only has educational support like reference materials, there's basically a mini textbook at the beginning of this planner, but it also just has journey support because there's journal spaces, uh, there's a lunar calendar, there's a transit calendar to help you 
learn astrology, but to actually start living uh, very cyclically and cosmically, regardless of your experience level. This is what I love about this planner. It's very, very accessible, no matter what experience level you are with astrology. Personally, I use it for both my personal life and my business. It's an integral part of my planning and scheduling practices. Now this year for the 2023 edition, their new theme is astromycology. So in this 280 page astrology planner, uh, again, that is for all different experience levels. We are now getting the extra edition of mycology exploration or the magic and healing properties of mushrooms. And this is absolutely a fascinating subject to me, as I'm sure it already is to so many of you. Um, And the cool part is, is not only is there a section in the planner with different types of mushrooms and their healing properties and benefits, but they also have an exploration on astrology to fungi connection, which I think is so cool. Get yours today and support that witch podcast by ordering yours at the link in the show notes below. So we know that you don't have to use love magic just for attracting the love of your life um, or or just enhancing the love in your life. It absolutely can be used for those things. Um, but I want you to get creative with this and, and know that these concepts of love and lust and sex, the reason why they're so worthy to dive into in your shadow work and your healing journey before heading into all this is because they're fucking powerful forces. This is powerful energy that we're working with and it can do a lot for you. So broaden your own horizons, expand your own horizons. All right. And let's jump into these correspondences a little bit. So when it comes to all of these areas, um, let's start with colors. Um, red, crimson, and pink are probably the most commonly referred to and utilized colors for sex magic and love work. Um, and they are very, very effective. There's a reason why they're the prominent colors of Valentine's Day. Um, but I want to make honorable mention to a couple of other favorites, including orange, which is the color of your sacral chakra, which rules over your sexual health and organs and sexual energy and sexual experiences, um, sexuality in general, your sexual power. So orange is a wonderful one. Anything that relates to fire and heat, um, definitely, definitely going to be in the realm of love and passion and lust and sex. Okay. So oranges and anything of the variety are perfect. Um, I also want to talk about black. I think that black is an extremely healing color when it comes to all of this work. Um, Number one, black up until now has been seen as and stigmatized as this negative color. And we've attached this negative connotation to it for years and years, if not centuries, possibly even longer. Um, it's, it's been weaponized against groups of people and, and utilized in racism to oppress people and abuse them and keep them down. Um, it's, for, for cultures across the world. And, and so here's why I think black is so healing because it, of its inherent taboo nature that it now has. And I think that because of that, there's a lot of reclamation of power when we harness and wear and utilize the color black. So utilizing black candles in your sex magic and your love magic, I think is this really like sexy, bold, rebellious, powerful way to to bring healing and confidence to this ritual work for yourself. So um, that can be like black lingerie and uh, it can also just be black clothing that you feel really fucking good in. Um, And it can be, and 
that leads me perfectly into that can be any color here. Um, you knew I was going to say that, didn't you? I, of course, any color can be utilized for this because for this kind of work, because the truth is at the end of the day, we all have favorite colors and the colors that we're drawn to at any given moment in our life. And so colors, um, and going with what you're called to, or your partner's called to, or what you just feel comfortable in, um, those, those are wonderful colors to utilize. So it does not have to fall into the, you know, the list of colors that are associated with, with love and sex work. Um, also throughout these pages in the book of correspondences, when it comes to crystals, okay? So now crystals, some of the best crystals for love and lust and sex work are going to be anything very earthy. So sex work is extremely grounding and root activating. Um, our, our genitals and our sexual organs are associated with the root chakra. And so any kind of stone that's red, black, brown, um, it's a crystal that's formed by sediment. That's a really great one. So like agate, jasper, um, honestly, all crystals, and I know you're like, you're killing me. You're going to say all of them again, aren't you? Yes, I am. Because all earth or all crystals are from the earth. So all of them are going to technically activate, um, your root and the earthy parts of yourself and your soul and your body in this life. Um, but the earthier, the better. So like I said, the agate, the jasper, I also think that geodes are wonderful for this. Geodes are like, totally glossed over in the witchcraft and new age and like spiritual community and like crystal healing community. And one thing I appreciate about, appreciate about the actual geology community, like when you go to gem and mineral shows and you talk to, you know, actual geologists that, that mind for these crystals themselves with their own bare hands, they have such an appreciation for it, for the ones that we're like, uh, it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't have that magical association, doesn't look pretty and sparkly. Geodes come from the earth and hold this beautiful surprise inside. They're filled with wonder and there's mystery and the unknown and you have to follow your intuition on which one you choose and cracking that open hello could be a wonderful wonderful way to illustrate and symbolize a culmination or breaking point breaking out of something um which again hello i hope you can see how applicable that would be to love lust and sex magic um now i want to talk a little bit about herbs and plants here. And we're going to take a little bit of a kitchen magic spin on this. And we're going to get a little weird with it. And I don't give a fuck. So kitchen magic is probably one of the most common ways love spells have been performed. Um, and think about it, right? Like putting a love potion into a lover's drink and making that person fall in love with you. Like that old, like archetype of a story. Um, this is how a lot of old ritual magic was practiced. So, um, one of the books I've recommended for you that you can find in the show notes below is called the encyclopedia of 5,000 spells. I've had this book for about five years now. And I kind of stopped looking for any kind of ritual or spell book after this because it's so all inclusive. And again, because my style of magic is so much more of, I take my, I take in the information and I put my own spin on it. And then I let my intuition kind of guide me in the actual ritual itself. So I'm more of a person who likes reading through a lot of suggestions formulating my own intuitive blueprint, if you will. So I am not a person that follows spells or regular food recipes at all. You will never find me following them exactly. I always use them for inspiration and kind of do my own thing, which is why I'm not a good baker. <laughs> yes, I mess it up all the time because I don't follow the recipe exactly. When it comes to herbs and plants, 
We have to talk about kitchen magic because this is the primary form you're going to see these correspondences utilized in love magic. Now, I can tell you all about the common herbs. And here, let me give you some of them. Um, The really, really popular ones um, that branch kind of all of these, love, lust, sex, sensuality, um, romance, all of it. Definitely going to be basil. Basil is the universal attractor. Use it for attracting fucking literally anything. That's one of its main, main, main um, intentions and, and metaphysical properties is an attractant. Okay. So basil should be in your arsenal. Cinnamon, big one when it comes to this. We've got fiery, warm, comforting, and yet exciting cinnamon. Again, I hope that description explains why we utilize cinnamon in this type of work. Uh, dragon's blood. <clears throat> dragon's blood is a really big one. Uh, may or may not be as commonly referred to um, or recommended, but dragon's blood is a resin that I, it's a wonderful self-empowerment tool. Um, And so this is why it can be so beneficial in any of these areas. If you're trying to get up the guff to ask somebody out or put yourself out there and go on the dating sites or, or call somebody first or text them first or get up the nerve to ask your partner to try this thing or to say you don't want to do this thing anymore, whatever it is that you're needing to like work up your courage, dragon's blood. Dragon's blood really helps you step into your own personal power. And because of its associations with crimson and red and fire and flames, it's gonna, um, it's gonna turn up the heat, if you know what I mean. Um, (laughs) so, uh, we've also got, let's see here, lavender, jasmine, hibiscus, rose, All of these, any of those classic quintessential florals, we most of us already associate flowers in general, anything that make us think of beauty. Um, we can absolutely utilize in love and lust and sex magic. And this can be to represent the beauty that you feel in the connection or the relationship or the beauty that you want to appreciate in yourself, um, the beauty you want to honor in your lover, whatever that is. Um, I, I really think that beauty gets dogged on as like this narcissistic vain, like vanity fucking intention. And it's not. Venus teaches us that beauty is sacred and we all perceive it and experience it differently. And each of those ways that we experience it is in and of itself also beautiful. So um, don't be afraid to get pretty. And when I say get pretty, I mean like, don't be afraid to like make your space look a little nice. Make yourself feel like you look good? Do you like how you feel about yourself? How can you enhance the concept of beauty in and around yourself? That's a great way to incorporate it. Um, And flowers, all those, those quintessential florals, like I said, those are a wonderful, wonderful way to connect with and do that. Um, Other ones uh, that are really, really uh, beneficial and very powerful in this kind of work, vanilla. Vanilla is a big one. Vanilla sweetens everything. It's smooth. It bridges the gap. It's a very usually universally received, well-received scent um, and aroma. Not always literally, but in overall it is. Um, it's very, very popular. So vanilla, this is a great one. Um, but also obviously going into cacao and chocolate. Um, this has already, this already has ancient roots in love and lust and sex work. Um, so especially utilizing kind of both that chocolate and vanilla, that could be a really, really nice, uh, and probably delicious combination (laughs) for your love spells. Now, um, peppermint, rosemary, sandalwood. Uh, let's see here. I'm just reading through all these. Ah, yes. The fruit trees, of course, any kind of berry, cherry, um, blackberries, raspberries, uh, strawberries. Um, and then getting into the fruit trees, like apples and oranges, anything that bears fruit, um, is considered 
to be associated with fertility and what does fertility come from, but love and lust and sex. And so um, anything that bears a fruit is also a wonderful, wonderful plant ally to incorporate in your in your uh, spells and your ritual work. Now, this is where we're going to get a little weird with it. In its most ancient roots, love, lust, and sex magic has uh, formed a lot. So a lot of those spells were born in the kitchen, like I said, and uh, many of these ingredients and herbs that I've been listing have been included and utilized in those. And some of the ingredients utilized in those are also bodily fluids. This is an area of magic that gets people a little bit hypey in their dipey. <laughs> this really... We're going to ruffle a little bit of feathers here, but here's some of the best advice that I was ever given. Um, when you're in a safe and trusting environment, don't knock it till you try it. Um, now, the key words there are safe and trusting. I think that where we get the bad, no pun intended, bad taste in our mouth when it comes to talking about bodily fluids in love spells. So like, including your hair in food or your period blood or your spit or your urine. Um, these are utilizing your bodily fluids for magic is not new. It is very, 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 very old magic. Um, obviously born from a time where we didn't understand nearly what we do today about a consent, but also sanitary uh, conditions and general hygiene. Here's what I'll tell you. The bodily fluids that I just listed, blood, including menstrual blood, pee, and spit, and hair. Um, mm, hair is a little bit, mm, I'll take hair off that list and I'll give you a caveat there in a second. Technically, not harmful to ingest in small amounts. However, when it comes to the person consuming this, my personal belief and opinion and recommendation is having consent from that person. Um, if you are a person that is part of uh, the kink and fetish world, then this is probably not necessarily very new information to you. Um, but if you're not a part of that world, this might be very, very new information to you. There are people out there that like to consume those things. And part of their sexual drive and, and sexual enjoyment is in total and complete surrender to their partner or partners. Um, and on the flip side, a person's drive can be from safely exerting dominance and power over somebody. In the fetish and BDSM world, we call this a uh, submissive and dominant roles, which you may or may not have heard of before. And my husband and I, we are very proud ethical kinksters and, and, fetishers. <laughs> what do I call that? Um, we engage in and participate in consensual, submissive, and dominant roles. Uh, we're also switches. So we began and lived most of our relationship, technically up until this point, specifically leaning in submissive and dominant roles that we never swapped out of. And I leaned into and and embodied my dominant role uh, pretty much all of the time. And he leaned into and embodied his submissive role pretty much all of the time. Um, I'll definitely credit my amazing husband for being the one who really introduced me to the safety of the of the kink life and and the kink roles early, early, early on in our relationship. He's been somebody since I become friends with them, since I was so young and we were such close friends all throughout our teenage years, we have, we've been talking about and sharing our 
sex life and sexual experience with each other as like platonic friends forever. So we're very blessed and lucky and um, are able to like have very comfortable conversations about sex um, and always have been able to. It doesn't mean it doesn't ever get uncomfortable. Of course, we have to have hard conversations um, and have before. But uh, it that was not an area of blockage for us. Like it can be so commonly. Um, so we, you know, we entered into our relationship officially when we were really, really, really young. Um, I had just turned 23 and he had just turned 24. So we were really young. And um, he had already been in the world and in the life uh, lifestyle and in his own fetishes for a, quite some time. And I had known about all of them because he had been, you know, we talked about them and shared them with each other. Um, but I, you know, being in my first truly safe, my my sexual relationships before him were for the most part safe um on a base level on a what we would call in the fetish community on a vanilla level i experienced mostly safe circumstances and boundaries um but not outside of that and i never ever ever experienced safety in sexual experimentation. I had never dated anybody interested in that, nor encouraging of that. And the people I had dated before that were very identifying with that vanilla role, um, which is fine and to each their own. But when I um, started dating my husband officially, and again, we already knew these things by each other. We had already been comfortable talking about them for years and years before this. Um, he was the first partner that really encouraged and gave me the space to like sexually explore and experiment, which was life changing for me. Um, that can definitely be something you incorporate into your magic, by the way, is opening yourself up to new safe experiences and new safe expression. Um, but, you know, since then, since my early 20s, I have done some fucking deep dives. I mean, I have become a part of the fetish and kink community. I've met people and talked with people. I've read articles and forums. And I mean, I have like gone down the rabbit hole hours. And again, not even close to how far you can go. But my point is, is I've, I've done a lot, a lot of learning. And I need you to understand that even if this doesn't make sense to you, there are people that enjoy and ask to and consent to consuming those bodily fluids. So I, this is why, this is the context I'm trying to give you when I say, don't knock it till you try it. And you will more often not find your own enjoyment and your own boundaries on that way if you're not knocking it till you're trying it. And when you try it, you can go, huh not for me. Or yes, definitely for me. More of that, please. Um, which is really exciting and a really good thing. So keep in mind that if you have felt interested in, um, like doing blood magic or utilizing your urine or your spit into ritual work, I want you to do your thorough research on safe consumption, I want you to lead with ethics and consent and safety. And I want you to have fun and have a good time because again, it has roots in ancient, ancient practices and magic. You're not a freak. You're not a weirdo. You're valid and you're, and you're, you're seen and, and heard here. Okay. So again, lead with consent, lead with safety and ethics. And I'm wishing you all the fun in all of your sexy, lovey kitchen magic work, whatever you want to do with all of your ingredients. Okay. Now on to some deities. There are a trillion. Okay. This is not even remotely a complete list. I could never get a complete list. I'm going to give you the people, the people, the deities that were jumping out at me, um, including a lot of the really common ones. When it comes to sex and sexuality, goddesses and gods like Aphrodite, Anat, Artemis, uh, Bast, Freya, Ishtar, let's see here, the Morgan, Venus, Coyote, Dionysus, Eros, 
the green man, Hermes, um, Odin, Pluto or Hades, Shiva, Zeus, all of these uh, wonderful deities and archetypal energy to call on and work with when it comes to sex and sensual sex and sexuality. Um, when it comes to sensuality, according to Book of Correspondences, uh, we would add on, we have mostly those same gods and goddesses here, but we would also add on, oh no, they're all the exact same ones that are here. Sorry. So when it comes to sex and sensuality, pretty much uh, the same kind of archetypal energy to work with. Now, when it comes to uh, love and romance, this is a humongous list, obviously, as you can imagine. Here it is. There we go. Um, again, Aphrodite and Venus, obviously. Um, Inanna, Ishtar, Brigid, Freya, um, Hathor, Hecate, Hera, Luna, the moon in general, um, big one. I would honestly throw Demeter in here. Diana is on here. Yin energy. Uh, Cupid is under here. Shiva again. Krishna, Pan, Eros again. Um, wonderful archetypal energy to call on and work with. You can honestly, though get pretty creative when it comes to deity, entity, and archetypal energy. And what you call on, it really depends on how you resonate with that deities or archetypes energy and how it would apply to the ritual for you. So again, it does not need to be at all limited to that list. Now, when it comes to like numbers and days of the week, again, you could make a case for any number in any day of the week for a multitude of reasons. But um, Friday is Venus Day and Tuesday is Mars Day. So both of these are going to be wonderful for specifically sex and pleasure. Venus is going to bring in that compassion and that value and that beauty. Mars is going to lean more into the desire and the passion and the fiery and the um, like animalistic energy of the whole entire thing. Um, but Mercury Day Wednesday would be another lovely day for specifically tapping into your voice if you're needing to have a conversation about this or speak your truth when it comes to any of these big themes, um, Jupiter's day, Jupiter is the Roman equivalent of Zeus, which we talked about as being a wonderful deity to work with for sensuality, sex, and love. So Zeus's day or Jupiter's day on Thursday, another really great day, especially because Jupiter is very, very concerned with pleasure and joy and fulfillment um, and gratitude of all those things. So those are going to be some nice uh, prominent days for ritual work. Like we talked about with the moons, great moon phases are definitely going to be the full moon when it comes to, you know, highlighting and leaning into and working with that orgasm, that peak, that culmination point type of energy. But the new moon is also wonderful because the dark moon is when we move into the darkness and the blackness and those themes in life. Um, the taboo topics, again, like we talked about with the color black and utilizing that in your magic. So the new moon time is still going to be a wonderful time for um, love and lust and sex magic. But I wanted to point out the quarter moons specifically for working through tension and potentially working through tension through sexual release. So if you're feeling a lot, a lot, a lot of tension build up around the quarter moons each month, which is normal because the moon and the sun are forming a square to each other, which is what forms a quarter moon itself, um, doing some self magic through some self touch and masturbation. Uh, this can be a really, really wonderful way to work through the tension that comes with that time of the lunar cycle every month, okay? Um, as far as numbers go, it depends on what your intentions are, but the number one, obviously, if you're really focusing on self, uh, the number two, when you're really, really focusing on partnership and other outside of yourself, 
if you specifically are part of an like an open relationship or a polyamorous relationship, um, you can utilize the number for the amount of partners in your, uh, maybe it's a thruple, maybe a thruple is a word for uh three people that are in a consenting polyamorous relationship with each other. So the number really comes down to your intentions. But those, the number one for self, the number two for partner, and then any other number representing, you know, partners or what, or representing number of intentions, whatever that might be for you. Um, let your intuition guide you when it comes to utilizing numerology for your love and your lust and your sex magic work. So I know this was a longer episode. Thank you for sticking with me. I really appreciate your time here today. I hope you had some fun and I hope you learned some stuff today. I just, I wanted this to be thorough. I wanted to inspire you. I think that this time of year, right before Valentine's Day, Um, It really brings out all the naysayers and I really do get it. I really get where it comes from. I'm a person who has experienced heartache and heartbreak and um, betrayal and, and trauma when it comes to those areas of life and that kind of loss and grief as well. So I know that I'm a person who's married right now in a good partnership with a healthy sex life. That doesn't mean that I don't have that experience and I don't have the empathy for that. So I want you to know that you're valid in those um, maybe heavier or harder feelings that come up around this time of year. And I still encourage you to remember what we talked about at the beginning of this episode, that we experience love and lust and sex in this life for very big, important reasons. And so it doesn't have to look like cheesy Cupid's arrow, big red heart love. It doesn't have to look like anything. It just needs to be meaningful and sacred and safe for you and anyone else that you're involving. And so I want you to think about that and how you can honor and work with these incredibly powerful energies, love, lust, and sex, and utilize them for what they are, but also creatively in your path and in your craft for yourself. So thank you so, so much for today. Again, thank you for sticking with me through this nice long episode. Um, I would love, especially if you're in Mighty Networks as a full-time student, I would love to hear your thoughts on this episode, any questions that you're having. Before we go, I have to offer you my little neighbor segment. We're not going to do this at the very, very, very end every single time. I'm not sure when it'll be in the episode, but one new thing I wanted to do um, instead of the neighbor highlight, well, we're still doing the neighbor highlight, but it's going to be called the neighbor spotlight. And instead of doing it the way I've been doing it, what I want to do is ask all of you, my wonderful neighbors, I want to ask you a question on every show. And I would love it if you would submit your answer to me. You can submit your answers by going to thatwitchnextdoor.com slash conjure that witch and submit your form that way. If you're already on Mighty Networks, you can send me a DM there. You can send me a DM on Instagram. I'm not as consistent about checking that as I am email. Um, And then, of course, if you're in that witch school as a next door neighbor or a part time student, you should already have my email. You can always reply directly to my school bulletin email that I send out to you every week and submit your answer to me that way. I I want as many answers as possible. So don't, don't hesitate to hold back. The only thing I ask is that I want you to remember that I am going to personally read through all of these and I'm going to try and shout people out on the show. Um, so I, I won't have time to read through like novels and novels of experiences, but I would love your brief and concise answer to uh, the weekly question and for a chance to get your answer shouted out on the following episode. I just want to share the answers that I get that I think will offer the most 
insight or inspiration or camaraderie among the neighborhood. So the question I'm leaving with you for this week, and I I think it's perfect for everything we talked about today because we had to talk about a lot of this raw stuff like lust and, and, and love and sex magic. And I hope it got you stepping into your magic and witchy power. So I want to ask you this. When was the first time you really felt like a witch or an energy practitioner? And I want to leave it open-ended like that. I don't want to guide you at all. When was the first time in this life that you really felt like a witch. It doesn't have to be the time you officially declared it. My, that is not that for me. The time that I officially declared it and the time that I really felt it are very different. So just the time that you really felt it or a time that you really felt in the pocket of your own magical power. Please share your experience with me. I cannot wait to read it. And I'm so excited to read them on our next episode on our Neighbor Spotlight segment. Thank you so much for your time today and every day. I can't wait to see you next week. I hope you have a lot of fun with what we talked about this week. And uh, make sure you stay safe out there, especially with all this stuff that we went into. Stay safe. Make sure you have a ton of fun and stay magical out there, my friend. so much for listening if you enjoyed that witch podcast today i would be super super grateful if you would take a moment to head over to apple or spotify and leave a rating and review it really helps to support the show or if you just have a friend that you think would enjoy what we're doing what we're talking about here you can just share the show with them as well now if you yourself like what you're doing here and you want to get more into the magic of the neighborhood, I highly recommend checking out my monthly membership, That Witch School. It's kind of like a witchier, more interactive uh, style of Patreon subscription where you can enroll at a tier level that fits your lifestyle and budget. You can get instant access to all of the bonus content that we've already done, as well as all of the future amazing to come bonus content that we'll be doing in the future together. There's exercises for strengthening your intuition. There are loads of resources for studying astrology and learning your birth chart. We've got guest workshops, bonus episodes, exclusive discounts, and so much more. My full-time students also get exclusive access to Mighty Networks, our private online community platform, which is basically like a way better and way more magical social media platform with a bunch of really cool people like you that just want to learn from and support one another on this witchy spiritual journey. If this sounds like something that you would really enjoy, head over to that witchnextdoor.com slash enroll and explore the tier level of that witch school that would fit you today. Now, if you have any questions after the episode today, any inquiries, show suggestions, anything you'd like to share with me, you can head over to that witchnextdoor.com slash conjure that witch. Remember, I'm just always right next door. Thank you so much. And I'll see you next episode.